I haven't done a James Bond episode in a while. Then again, there is a sequel to Top Gun coming out this week. Huh, what do I do? Oh, I know! 70s Bond knockoff that just happens to have Top Gun in the title. That's right, this 1977 British film stars the character of Charles Bind, not James Bond, get it right? The film comes to us from Lindsay Shontef, who has a number of spy movies to his name, as well as the classic Devil Doll, as featured on Mystery Science Theater. He had also directed another Bond parody called Licensed to Kill. No, goddammit, not Licensed to Kill. This one starred a character named Charles Vine. Again, not Charles Bind, keep up. The movie was later retitled The Second Best Secret Agent in the Whole Wide World and was an international success that got a couple of sequels. With there being a delay between the two Bond films, The Man with the Golden Gun and The Spy Who Loved Me, that was the perfect time to return with a new series of spy films. Due to there being a rights problem with the producer of the previous movies, Charles Vine became Charles Bind which was also the name of a supporting character in the 1964 film Carry On Spying. Here, Charles Bind is played by Royal Shakespearean actor Nicky Henson and was released under the title of Number One of the Secret Service. He's loaded for action! I bet they're talking about his dick! Oh, and he trash talks, too. Tell the other guy to move over. I'm number one. So it also works as a 70s version of gangster number one. He's not talking about Bond here. He's obviously talking about the second best secret agent. Screw you, Charles Vine! Of course, on VHS, it's called Her Majesty's Top Gun. Because we have all the time in the world for speed. I've got a good feeling about this one because this is literally the opening shot. Well, this is already the greatest movie ever made. Can't wait for the James Bond style opening credits. Never mind, it has extreme TV pilot movie energy. Surely that puts this in the codename Diamond Head universe. It even has guest stars, Sue Lloyd, immediately going to HR and then back to the saint. What? Doctor Who? And just who is he shooting at? This just looks inconvenient. This somehow still has an amazing opening credit sequence. Sure, these are clips from the movie, but I have to know the context for everything that is happening. And I need this theme song on vinyl. Give it in. This is Givin' It Plenty by Simon Bell, a song also used for the 1977 movie Tintorera Killer Shark. Was someone giving it to a shark in that film? Wait, what? The movie may be starting, but it already looks like it's in a rush to be over. This is either some kind of protest or the milk crate challenge. You know you're watching exploitation movie gold when the copy you find has foreign subtitles. This is gonna be Bruno Mattei's Terminator 2 levels of amazing. They're all listening to a speech from, I don't know, some kind of cult leader maybe? Someone watching is not a fan. They want to prevent another Reverend James Johnson situation from happening. To a group of freedom fighters in South America. Or they just want to kill that guy. He was not pulling off that hat. Well, he's off to go dance the night away. Uh, what? Richard Todd? Well, the assassin's got to kill someone else now, I suppose. Here, George Banks will do. This is all part of an evil organization. No, not Spectre, you fools. It's Crash. Want to know what that stands for? K-R-A-S-H. Killing, raping, arson, slaughter, and hit. The hell? That doesn't sound like an organization. That sounds like a potential tagline for a Clockwork Orange. If only they mentioned they also listen to Beethoven. This group is tough. They have the character Eye Patch on their side. He's played by Milton Reed. He was Sandor in The Spy Who Loved Me. He is super rude. Not only does he kill this man, but he spits on him too. In this ring, we do not bother with the count of ten. Probably because the guy's dead. 
Crash is ready for evil. They don't even give you the time to wipe the shaving cream from your face. They have their own ways of getting ready for the day. You know, there's a more convenient way to do that. I buy that he shaved with bullets way more than I buy that it left no razor burn. Crash may be evil, but they still spend their Sundays together having a nice picnic. Richard Todd plays Arthur Loveday, who wants to pay them five million pounds for having financiers assassinated. Only one man can stop him. The sweet soundtrack. He looks less like Roger Moore and more like Simon McCorkendale's Manimal. See? He just turned into a horny skunk. Well, when you're done groping the help, best talk to what? Jeffrey Keen? M's taking the week off, so running the show is Sir Frederick Gray, the Minister of Defense from the Bond movies. I totally believe they're in a government office. Look, they have a map in the background. That's all I need. Even Keen asks, why are you using two magnums? Yes, well, 38's all very well in a lady's handbag, sir. But my 357 combat magnums can stop an elephant at 200 yards. I doubt that's gonna happen in this. Anyway, if you need an ass to grab, here's your new partner, Anna Hudson, played by Amy McDonald. And for God's sakes, be subtle. I have never been drier. Even Keen looks severely annoyed by this as it goes on for a while. He's gonna accidentally shoot her, isn't he? Hudson says she'll be his protege, but only on the condition that there's always metal bars between her and Bind. Though it's time for a commercial break. The number one secret agent needs the number one agent in Thirst. Brought to you by Pepsi and Hot Dog Buns. We'll be right back. Charles Flay. Whoa. Shaken, not stirred. Now that we're back, we didn't kill Kenneth McMillan earlier, so best keep an eye on him. Someone's probably gonna shoot at him. Don't worry, she's got pictures. Sure, they're too blurry for us to read or see anything, but I guess they'll do. We've got important work to do. Soda? Yes, please. When he's not being a pervy idiot. Here, I got a spare sexy tank top and panties for you to wear. <laughs> he's so thoughtful. Even the assassins are nice. They just walk right in for everyone to see. How is Bind gonna get out of this one? <laughs> what? How? This bulletproof wall is activated whenever a gun is pointed at me. Oh, stop it! Damn, he's good. He just immediately goes to the villain to question him. Arthur is probably a smooth talker, though. He can talk himself out of any situation. In the manner of speaking, you might say that I killed them. In what manner of speaking? Let's just say that I killed them. Okay, is this the end? Seems to be getting solved fast. He straight up tells him, Look, I just really don't like rich people and I'm going to kill again. So you could always try to stop me. I never minded a bit of healthy competition. Well, I know I could take you in right now, and this would definitely hold up in court, but really, I'm just here to get laid. I'd like you to meet Stormy Weather. No, what are you doing? You're messing up Stormy Weather before her porno shoot later. Anyway, back to laying out the entirety of my plan to you. Then you can report back to your boss. Look, sir, I think we should follow Arthur. He told me everything, and I mean everything. Really, it's kind of dumb that I just left him there. Oh, oh, but the tables have turned. Take off your coat. Why, sir? Get it off. Yeah, let's see how you like it, Bind. Leave our female agents alone. But now that Bind has his disguise set with an uncanny Aaron Eckhart mask, he's joined Arthur on his boat. And this is the last place you should go for a shave. They're gonna shoot it off at your face. Plus, they're closed. Perhaps he could have gotten away with it if he didn't just stand in front of him with the intent to kill him. Now time for the stare off. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
I'd like to think they're just dragging it out to listen to more of the swingin' musical score! Okay, the music's over now, so he can kill the guy and say his hilarious pun. That was a close shave. Yeah, <laughs> funny. You had a shave. <laughs> yeah, it's a close one. I heard you the first time! Although, I sort of respect a movie where the hero actually acknowledges no one was there to hear his one-liner, so he finds someone to repeat it to. Again, Arthur just tells him, yeah, that was me who sent the assassin. That first effort was very clumsy. One down, two to go, Mr. Bind. Worst agent ever. Even James Bond didn't think with his dick this much. I had it installed in case we ran aground. <laughs> Sure, someone's trying to kill me, but there's a wet t-shirt that needs my assistance! No wonder the assassins take no time to show up. They even put up a sign that might as well say, We are shooting someone. Thankfully, the villains are dumber than he is. <laughs> eh, just stand there and take the bullets. He's gonna kill you all anyway. Even when he does fight one of them, I'm not exactly sure what's going on here. What, is there gonna be a pun about shoes? You knocked him off his feet? Well, at least he had guts. Yes. Hey, now he's just a thief! He's stealing George Lazenby's one-liners! Welp, I guess I'll try again later. <laughs> Enjoy your vacation, Mr. Bind. And I don't even know how to explain this next scene. Oh. Oh. Fangs for the memory. Fangs ain't what they used to be. What? Well, he couldn't decide between his two fangs jokes, so he decided to use them both. This movie is getting random. Who the hell is this guy? What have you come as? I'm the clean-shaved kid. Hoo-hoo, <laughs> clean-shaved kid. Intimidating. What is this movie's obsession with shaving? No matter, he just shoots him. Like it's a whole movie of this scene from Raiders, and also a whole movie of this. Gotcha. Ah! You know she's gonna run out of white shirts to wear. Also, Arthur is gonna run out of people to shoot. <laughs> Don't you mind him, this kind of thing happens daily around here. Move along. Seriously, that's the end of the scene. No reason to spoil dinner. So, Mr. Bind, I planned for a man to be assassinated. Your partner saw the whole thing, but let's have drinks. Bind couldn't give less of a shit. <laughs> yes, well, that's life. I mean, pff, whatever. You win some, you lose some. Really, Nicky Henson isn't bad in this. Not that I'd actually want to see him play Bond, but had this been an actual pilot for a TV series, he would have been a good choice. He even sent flowers, which I'm sure will somehow spray water on her. Or it was sent by this person. I don't know. Okay, thanks for the delivery, villain. There's still a strong chance this could turn into a porno. Look, just assume everyone you don't know is an assassin. That will make this a lot easier. With the Magnums, I'm not gonna say it's like James Bond meets Dirty Harry, but more like James Bond meets Dirty O'Neal. Though Dirty O'Neal still had more convenient weapons than this. It's like I'm watching a movie version of when I used cheats and Goldeneye so I can play with the double Magnums. This really is the most powerful handgun in the world! See? It made that guy vanish before the explosion went off. This dude can't even walk to his car in any kind of convenient manner. I saw it in the opening credits. He even has a spy car full of gadgets. By that I mean a giant gun that he can just mow down the villains with. <laughs> Okay, so he's James Bond, and also Django. I can follow this. Here, let me tend to your wound by putting vodka on your head. That'll fix you right up. So, are you still alive? Yep. Okay, well, I'll be on my way. See you at dinner. But not before the mayor is gonna have Jeffrey Keen's ass! Thirty-six dead mercenaries? I know you're licensed to kill number one, but this is ridiculous. You gave him a machine gun car! He could still take care of the villains now, but it would just be bad form to interrupt his archery practice. 
Richard Todd is really good in this, too. Him I could actually see playing a Bond villain in the 70s. Not that it would have been one of the best ones, but he does bring some class into this, and plays the part as if he would if it wasn't a knockoff movie. Or predictable... Oh, she's wearing white again. I wonder where this is going. Aren't you hungry? <laughs> oh my god! Best get eye patch back in here. We saw him briefly earlier. <laughs> I forgot he was in the movie. This may seem like overkill, but it's probably best to aim the rocket launcher directly at him. Though it would just bounce off of him somehow, I'm assuming. He's gonna figure out some stupid way to survive, like just taking the gun away. <laughs> How did this even happen? Or this? It helps when you can just cut to a car that's already wrecked. He's had a long day. He needs to assault someone. Anyone! Can anyone else help you? Oh, sister. For the love of God, give her a rocket launcher too! I don't know what this has to do with Doctor Who, but we need to fulfill all of our special guest star promises. Is this turning into a darker bind movie now? It all goes back to when I was at boarding school. So... Also, is he gonna jerk off in front of him? So I guess Arthur Lovejoy joined this religious organization and is a former minister or something? Hmm, is this movie making up stuff as it goes along? I guess it's a procedural now, as he goes to the former home of Arthur, and when we come back, Kojak is gonna go to work! A movie with special guest stars is a great place to talk about our Cameo page. Visit us now at Cameo.com slash The Cinema Snob, where you can get a birthday shout-out, a congratulations, ask a question, or anything else you want. Click on the link in the comments and in the description, and we'll see you soon. We are back, and she's not wearing white. He doesn't know what to do now. You don't mind if I put my head in your lap, do you? Good. That'll set the mood for their romantic dinner date. You sure you want to have one? No, thank you, Charles. I think, um... Ass! Oh, thank God she's leaving. Now we can have our own romantic dinner, Mr. Bind. It's okay, he goes home with the other girl, where apparently magnums are both of their fetishes. Again, I ask, how did he accidentally not shoot her? This is the complete opposite of safe sex. I bet she's got a diabolical plan to assassinate our hero. Mm, this is getting stupid. Even Anna had to save him, despite him already holding his weapons and still nearly getting himself killed by sleeping. Oh, that one didn't work? Guess I'll try again later. <laughs> There's only 15 minutes of the movie left, so I'm guessing Arthur will run out of hired goons at some point. Though it does get a little darker when Anna is taken away. Uh, the hell? Is she dead? Did he just stab her to death? Hey, mate, you're some lady killer. Not the time for jokes. What is the tone here? Plus, it turns out Telly Savalas' Blofeld was the main assassin this whole time. They are running out of ways for Charles Bind to survive this shit. Oh, he just shoots him and catches the bullet. Of course he does! Enough playing around. Time for me to now just shoot you in this hotel conference room we rented out. This movie raises more questions than it answers. Why are they now bringing out the gimp? What in the hell is going on here? Uh, this is sunshine. Oh, it's sunshine. That answers my questions. Only six minutes left. We could fight, I guess, but... <laughs> I'm really just here for the soundtrack. I wish the composer, Leonard Young, did more movies. The theme is awesome! And the only two credits to his name are this and the movie's sequel, Undercover Lover. And just when you think Bind is about to die... That wasn't very sporting of you, Alan. The villain also does something dumb. The film's cinematographer, though, has a lot of credits, as it was shot by prominent TV DP Ivan Strasberg, who has shot episodes of Numbers, Cracker, 13 Reasons Why, and also the classic Fatal Contact, Bird Flu in America! 
oh, you think this still isn't going to end complicated? They finish it off with a game of Russian roulette. I shall spin the cylinder and fire at you and then at myself in turn. Just shoot him! Why is he doing this? I've never seen a Bond-type villain make it so easy for the movie's hero. Well, that was simple enough. Really, Bind didn't even need to be there. Well, since he can't squirt water in Anna's face, let's visit Jeffrey Keane in the hospital to make his life miserable. You really ought to be more careful getting out of your bath, sir. Oh, oh, oh. frankly, sorry, sir. My god, Frank Drebin wasn't this much of a reign of terror. Though it can't be too much of a bummer ending, bring in Anna, who perfectly survived her stab wound. Anna. Charles, I'm still ill. But of course you are. <laughs> it all comes full circle. There's still time left to get stupid. And that's the end of Charles Bind making love to his Bind girl, right on top of M, who lays injured in a hospital with several broken bones. What in God's name did I just watch? Well, whatever it was, it was every James Bond movie stereotype amped up to a hundred. This plot could have been resolved in about five minutes, but I'm glad it wasn't, because whether intentional or not, it was pretty funny, and I'm assuming the humor was intentional. This movie was seen enough for there to be two sequels, one of which was in 1979 called Undercover Lover, or sometimes Licensed to Love and Kill, where Bind was played by Gareth Hunt, and then in 1990 with Number One Gun, here played by Michael Howe. I'm pretty sure next week, though, we'll get to something even more sleazy. <laughs> what? Is it time to finally watch 365 Days this day? Ooh, that one promises to be way gropier than this one. It was a tight squeeze.